to press on with our second talk, and it's entitled Selina, Countess of Huntington, Queen of the Methodists, and she's around the same time as, uh, as Whitfield, so we'll see there's a bit of crossover. I thank your ladyship for the information concerning the Methodist preachers, replied the Duchess of Buckingham in a letter to a fellow noblewoman. Thanks, but no thanks, as it turned out. The Methodist, she went on, was strongly tinctured with impertinence and disrespect towards their superiors, perpetually endeavouring to level all ranks. Worst of all, the Duchess was particularly upset by the uncomfortable implications of the doctrine of original sin upon her own sense of innate superiority. It's monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl on the earth. This is highly offensive and insulting, and I cannot but wonder that your ladyship should relish any sentiments so much at variance with high rank and good breeding. The certain ladyship on the receiving end of this candid correspondence was the then 34-year-old Selina Hastings, Countess of Huntington. Uh, recently converted, Selina was keenly aware that her privileged status within British high society came with rich gospel opportunities. In practice, this meant inviting her peers to join her in listening to famed evangelists like George Whitfield, whom she would later enlist as her personal chaplain. Uh, for all of her misgivings, the Duchess of Buckingham went on, your ladyship does me infinite honour by your obliging inquiries after my health. I'm most happy to accept your kind offer of accompanying me to hear your favourite preacher, your favourite preacher being, being Whitfield. Selina was a winsome and persuasive ambassador for the gospel in rarefied aristocratic circles. Before long, she was renowned for making the most of every opportunity on a national scale. Described by one of her contemporaries as the Queen of the Methodists, her unique contribution uh, lay in investing her considerable uh, resources uh, as a patron of the uh, burgeoning evangelical movement. Her entrepreneurial energy was exceptional, establishing and overseeing a network of Calvinistic Methodists, her so-called connection, uh, building chapels and populating them with a cadre of preachers and establishing a seminary to train future generations of evangelists. A tornado and a silver spoon wrapped into one, a five foot six force of nature and the heiress of old money. The Countess of Huntington stood alongside the Wesley brothers and Whitfield as one of the most visible leaders of the 18th century evangelical revival. Uh, Selina Hastings was born on the 24th of August, 1707, at Astwell Manor in Northamptonshire. Although her upbringing was materially privileged, it was also filled with relational dysfunction. Her aristocratic mother and father separated when she was only six years old. Her mother relocated to France with Selina's baby sister, while she and her older sister were raised by their father in England. When she was 17, Selina moved to Staunton Harold Hall in Leicestershire, a property she inherited after her dad's death. There she met, and in 1728 married, Theophilus Hastings, the ninth Earl of Huntington, who lived at nearby Donington Hall. By early 1732, the couple already had four children, and three more would follow in ensuing years. A pregnancy, it seems, took a really heavy toll on Selina's health. And as was the custom back in those days, on doctor's orders, she was sent to Bath to take the waters as a way of recuperating. From all accounts, the whole experience was uh, medicinally underwhelming and socially nauseating. Quote, the most stupid place I ever yet saw, she wrote. Her expeditions to the ancient Roman spa city would nonetheless leave a lasting impression on Selina, giving her a particular heart to reach what she styled as the fine ladies of Bath with the gospel in coming years. 
During the first decade of her marriage, the Countess of Huntington was religious and philanthropic, but it seems not yet converted. Uh, she found the sexual immorality and decadence that was so prevalent in her circles to be galling. Uh, when a worthy cause presented itself, she was financially generous. For example, when Thomas Coram wanted to establish a home and school for London's deserted infants, as a mother of young kids herself, Selina was one of the first to pledge her financial support. It wasn't until 1739 that Selina experienced spiritual regeneration. Initially, she joined John Wesley uh, in worshipping at the Moravian congregation at Fetter Lane. At this point in her journey, the Countess identified herself with the Wesley's brand of Arminianism, uh, renouncing unconditional predestination and embracing the possibility of entire sanctification. In 1741, she read John Wesley's recently published sermon on Christian perfection and was completely sold. The doctrine contained therein, I hope to live and die by. It's absolutely the most complete thing I know, she wrote. But there was another major theological tributary that fed into the Methodist stream known as Calvinism, one that embraced unconditional predestination and renounced the possibility of perfection. And Selina regularly crossed paths with many of its prominent figures, including Whitfield and the Welsh itinerant Howell Harris. Now, Whitfield, who'd recently engaged in a bru bruising public theological spat with the Wesleys, uh, one that would permanently divide the Methodists along Calvinistic and Arminian lines. Uh, he did his utmost to win Selina over, but she wasn't persuaded, um, at least not for now she wasn't. Within a few years, though, and Selina had begun to find Whitfield's position more compelling, and Wesley's less so. In the midst of long-standing struggles with her own indwelling sin, and a fragile sense of assurance. She discovered great comfort in God's promise to preserve those that he had unconditionally chosen from before the beginning of time. Whitfield's Calvinistic tabernacle at Moorfields and not Wesley's Arminian foundry a quarter of a mile away became her preferred London congregation. From this point onwards, for all of her affection for the Wesley brothers, her theological die was cast in a Whitfieldian mould. Uh, her religious principles were strictly Calvinistic, reflected one contemporary, and the doctrines of grace were the marrow and life of her soul. The Countess of Huntington's convictions about God's exhaustive sovereignty and goodness would be put to the test over the course of her life. Selina would bury six of her seven children uh, four of them in infancy or in childhood. Uh, two died of smallpox within a few months of each other while at boarding school. In 1746, she would also bury her husband. Uh, Theophilus had struggled with heart troubles for uh, many years, but despite the best efforts of uh, concerned friends, he refused to seek medical advice. Eventually, he relented and travelled to London for treatment. But just a few days before he left, he had a premonition of his imminent death, where, quote, death in the appearance of a skeleton stood at the bed's foot and after a while untucked the bedclothes at the bottom. In his recounting of this eerie dream to his wife the next morning, the skeleton then crept up to the top of the bed and lay between him and his wife. Kind of creepy. Selina wrote to him a few days after he left for London, and her letter betrays not only her anxious state of heart and mind, but also her deep affection for her husband. Sadly, Theophilus's dream proved prophetic. Selina wouldn't write or hear from her husband again. And just two weeks after this strange dream, he died of a stroke on the 13th of October, 1746, in London. The Countess of Huntington found herself widowed at the age of 39 and at a crossroads in her life. Overwhelmed by grief, for the next four months, she was a virtual recluse, 
and even contemplated withdrawing from society altogether. In early 1747, she consulted Howell Harris, the um, Welsh itinerant, about which was best, to live retired and give up all or to fill her place. In what would prove to be a pivotal conversation, Harris convinced her to live an active public life. And so from this point onwards, her mind was set. Quote, I dread slack hands in the vineyard. Uh, we must all be up and doing. Uh, in many ways, uh, Whitfield, and not Selina, was the obvious candidate for the role of supremo of the Calvinistic Methodists. Uh, arguably one of the most famous personalities of the 18th century, uh, as we've seen, uh, Whitfield was the first evangelical celebrity preacher and the very public face of the revivals that were sweeping the British Empire. But first and foremost, Whitfield was an itinerant evangelist at heart, not an administrator. Now, he had an allergic reaction to anything that threatened to restrict his mobility. Um, uh, and so um, in 1748, when he returned to England after a four-year stint in America, he was welcomed back ashore by Harris, Howell Harris, who immediately whisked him away to meet with Selina at her London home in Chelsea. As a PRS, Selina was entitled to appoint a number of personal chaplains, and she had Whitfield in her sights as just the larger-than-life personality to reach her contemporaries. And so over the summer, that summer of 1748, she hosted a series of events uh, designed to road test Whitfield's preaching before audiences composed of the, uh, the, the rich and the famous. Lord Bolingbroke, um, the first Chief uh, Secretary of State, the Earl of Chesterfield, amongst others. Uh, they embodied Selina's target audience. They were rich, they were famous, and they were unconverted. Quote, the grand itinerant's preaching was a hit. Uh, Bolingbroke's verdict was that Whitfield is the most extraordinary man of our times. He is the most commanding eloquence I've ever heard in any person. Lord Chesterfield was no less enthusiastic. Quote, Mr. Whitfield's eloquence is unrivaled, his zeal inexhaustible, and not to admire both would argue a total absence of taste. Selina was delighted. If anything, her expectations were exceeded. Uh, she reported to one friend, I must tell you that I have had two large assemblies at my house of the mighty, the noble, the wise, and the rich to hear the gospel by Mr. Whitfield. And I have great pleasure in telling you that they all expressed a great deal in hearing him. Whitfield, no less optimistic after these gatherings. I went home never more surprised at any incident in my life. The prospect of doing good to the rich that attend her ladyship's house is very encouraging. Who knows what God may do? To a fellow Methodist preacher, he wrote, the prospect of catching some of the rich in the gospel net is very promising. Even deists like Benjamin Franklin, who had an intimate working relationship with Whitfield as the main publisher of his journals and sermons in the American colonies, recognised the tremendous potential societal good that might transpire from the religious awakening of the upper classes. If you can gain them to a good and exemplary life, encouraged Franklin, wonderful changes will follow in the manner, in the manner of the lower ranks. Uh, Whitfield and Selina were a perfect ministry match. And so soon afterwards, the Countess offered and Whitfield accepted her scarf as her personal chaplain, always sure to adopt a posture of deference and humility towards his patroness, Whitfield's unexpected uh, upward social mobility left him giddy with excitement. Uh, he was the son of a publican, a lowly servitor at Oxford. Uh, by, by that I mean, while as, uh, as an undergraduate student, he had performed menial tasks as the servant of rich students in lieu of the uh, hefty tuition costs that were well out of his, uh, his own family's personal reach. Uh, and so Whitfield, uh, from this point onwards, uh, became, as he would henceforth always style himself, uh, chaplain to the Right Honourable Countess of Huntington. 
Now, if Whitfield knew himself well enough to realise that presiding over the Calvinistic Methodist societies was not his forte, then the newly appointed chaplain also knew just the person for the job. Um, Of course, none other than the Countess of Huntington. Quote, perhaps the Lord is fitting your ladyship for some new work, he wrote in May 1749. Six months later, and he was even more direct, a leader is wanting. This honour has been put upon your ladyship by the great head of the church. And so the Countess of Huntington assumed the organisational role that Whitfield had declined. Her evangelical entrepreneurialism was a critical factor in bringing an evangelical witness to the English aristocracy. Just as John Wesley established and oversaw a multitude of Methodist societies that he fashioned in his own theological image, likewise, Selina would establish and oversee societies of her own. Known as Lady Huntington's Connection, these were similarly fashioned in her own theological image. If Selina was empress of her new connection, then Whitfield was her prime minister. Whitfield's preferred description, that she was more like a good archbishop with her chaplains around him, perhaps better captures her desire to remain, as far as possible, a loyal member of the established church and avoid creating a rival denomination, though eventually this is kind of what happened in the long run, in her twilight years. Beginning in 1750, and extending over the next four decades, Lady Huntington's preachers proclaimed the gospel at a constellation of chapels throughout Wales and England. They eventually grew to 64 in number and provided places of worship where evangelical men could preach without the strictures often imposed upon them by the hierarchy of the church. Her initial practice was to lease properties with chapels attached But in time, this made way for building chapels from the ground up. Proximity to water-based leisure and recuperation was a recurring feature of the chosen locations for these chapels. Whether it be up-and-coming seaside resort towns like Brighton or fashionable spa towns like Bath and Tunbridge Wells. In Georgian Bath, a place where Selina had a long history and longed to see transformed by the gospel, she chose to employ her favourite style of architecture, the Gothic, uh, opened in 1765 with much fanfare. The Bath Chapel was created with her target, uh, target audience's tastes in view. Um, it also had a unique feature, a seat located immediately inside the front door, curtained off from the rest of the sanctuary, where high-ranking members of the Church of England, uh, high-ranking clergy, could listen to Selina's preachers incognito. Uh, Much of the the stigma that had initially been associated with the Methodists had wore off as time went on, but the prospect of a bishop undergoing the dreadful disgrace of being seen in such a place meant that uh, Nicodemus Corner, as it became known, Uh, was often occupied by these incognito um, clergy. The Countess of Huntington was careful to schedule public gatherings at times that didn't conflict with Church of England worship services. But in retrospect, conflict and eventually separation from the established church was inevitable. In 1779, just a couple of weeks after she opened her latest chapel at Sparfields in London... Uh, Thomas Hawes, an ordained Church of England clergyman, appointed as another of Selina's personal chaplains, had his right to preach challenged in court by the curate of the local parish. The prosecution case was simple and, as it turned out, persuasive. A chapel with seating for thousands, a public entrance and tickets sold for seating couldn't in any reasonable manner be construed as a private chapel. And so the tenuous legal foundation upon which Selina had uh, simultaneously attempted to build her connection and remain loyal to the Church of England, it crumbled. The court not only decided against the Countess, but also established a precedent for future ecclesiastical litigation against her chaplains. And so faced with the decision to either close her chapels or else register them under the Toleration Act as dissenting meeting houses, 
In 1782, she reluctantly chose the latter. Quote, I'm to be cast out of the church for what I've been doing these 40 years, speaking and living for Jesus Christ, she lamented with a dose of defiance. While some of her preachers followed her into dissent, most, like Hoace, remained within the Church of England and in the process contributed in part to the Calvinistic Methodist failure to flourish to the same degree that Wesley's Arminian Methodist wing. The Countess of Huntington's chapels multiplied at such a rate that the demand for preachers began to outpace supply. This immediate shortage, coupled in 1768 with Oxford University's decision to expel six students for holding Methodist tenets, provided Selina with the impetus to challenge Oxford and Cambridge's monopoly on training ministers and establish a seminary of her own. Trevecca College was the fruit of this vision. Originally a rundown farmhouse near Howell Harris's home in Wales, the Countess single-handedly funded every facet of the college's operations, from its initial renovation to paying for all of the faculty and staff wages to providing full bursaries for all of the students. She hoped, perhaps naively, that the Church of England would look kindly on Trevecca's graduates when it came to ordination. Now, the reality was that only a handful succeeded in this endeavour and the students from the college were often treated with suspicion. Trevecca opened on the Countess's 61st birthday. It was, in effect, a gift from herself to the wider church. Whitfield presided over the opening ceremonies. By this stage, the Countess only had two surviving children of her own, and she was actually estranged from one of them. In many ways, Trevecca's students would become her spiritual offspring. They certainly saw her in a maternal, if somewhat matriarchal, light. She regarded her young men as her sons, as her family, declared one Trevecca alumni in a sermon that he preached in Selina's honour soon after her death in 1791. With what affection and tenderness, wisdom and prudence have I heard her address the young men in the study around her. How she has warned, cautioned, reproved, comforted and encouraged us like a true mother in Israel. If the generosity of wealthy female patrons like Phoebe was integral to the flourishing of the gospel in the first century, then the generosity of wealthy patrons like the Countess of Huntington was no less integral to the flourishing of the gospel in the 18th century. For when I gave myself up to the Lord, said Selina, I likewise devoted to him all my fortune. The generation of preachers she helped raise up attested to her willingness to lay down at the foot of the cross her honours, titles, distinction and fortune. We're used to aristocrats forming their own regiments or cricket teams, wrote one biographer. But an aristocrat who started her own church is in a class apart. Indeed she was. If Wesley and Whitfield are celebrated as founding fathers of contemporary evangelicalism, then Selina was no less the movement's founding mother. The evangelical revival of the 18th century might never have gained the acceptance that it did apart from the endeavours of the Countess of Huntington, observed one biographer. The Countess used her unquestionable influence in the highest circles of the land and even in the royal court to throw the cloak of her protection over the prominent preachers of the day and over the fledgling Methodist movement itself. In fact, the verdict from the royal court was nothing short of glowing. Quote, There is something so noble, so commanding, and withal so engaging about Selina that I am quite captivated with her ladyship, commented none other, none other than King George III. I wish there was a Lady Huntington in every diocese in my kingdom. Um, not long after her death, sadly, yes. It was, um, it, it was so tethered to her continued financial support, it didn't have any um, yeah, other means of support, yes. Yep, yep. Yeah, 
in terms of doctrine. Yeah, so he was a high church Anglican, um, pr proudly so. Um, so both, both boys inherited that aspect. Um, I would argue that uh, uh, it was actually Susanna Wesley's influence that was even more profound on the Wesley brothers' theology. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, both mum and dad were Arminian-leaning, but um, when you look at the letters that John in particular wrote to his mum in 1725, so he's about 22, and he's trying to work... He's, uh, he's on the verge of being ordained. He wants to work out whether he should be ordained and what he believes when he gets ordained. And it's that correspondence with his mum where a lot of his really distinctive doctrinal commitments get bedded down. So his opposition to predestination, for example, his commitment to perfection, holiness as the essence of the Christian life. So locating sanctification rather than justification at the core of the Christian life. Really distinctive things in his theology. They all get bedded down does, he, doesn't, he doesn't migrate much, if at all, from um, those initial conversations with his mother in, in, in 1725. It's remarkable. Mm. His dad, I mean, his dad was influential, but yeah, I, m most, most interpreters of Wesley will see his mum as exerting even more influence. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the orphanage burnt down and she eventually um, uh, divested herself of the slaves. Um, yeah, but not immediately. It took some time. Uh, so she lived long enough to see um, that initial wave of anti-slavery abolitionist. Yeah, she, yeah, so she died about around the same time as Wesley. So she, um, she evolved a little bit, but um, certainly at the time of Whitfield's death, she was um, very much a uh, par for the course evangelical. Um, uh, uh, n n no pushback in her life at that point to, to slavery. Yeah. So in, in one sense, she, she inherited um, that millstone from, from Whitfield. Yeah. He, thought he, he thought he was doing her a kindness, but... <laughs> Yeah. Did Whitfield marry? He did, yes. Um, his wife's name was Elizabeth. Um, so they married in 1741, and they had one son, but he died very young. Um, she travelled with him a little bit to begin with, but she found it pretty tough going. You know, as I mentioned, so Whitfield's, he's crossing the Atlantic a lot. wasn't for everyone. Um, and she died a, a couple of years before he did. Yeah. So how long did it take? Um, a, a quick journey was about six weeks. Could take longer than that. It was pretty dangerous. Um, no, no Concord. No, no. So it was kind of his third space. So he saw the ship as a floating congregation. So he would either write, that, he'd spend that time writing letters, writing sermons, because once he landed, he was on the go, preaching, non-stop, multiple sermons every day. So he used that travel time to write as much as he could. I get the privilege of asking any questions at home. Um, but there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, can we be revisionists if we have the eternal word of God that never changes? Uh, shouldn't we be revisionists if we've got the eternal word of God that never changes? Uh, you're looking at Selena, uh, I automatically thought Gina Reinhart hmm. and Australian sport hmm. and patronage. Hmm. But then it also unpacks what the role of men and women and wealth and the way in which we understand them with the Bible. Uh, there is a lot of stuff 
uh, that's there. And so let me encourage you to listen to the talks again. You've got a new book out at the end of this year, roughly, on George Whitfield yeah. uh, and the spiritual life and the mm -hmm. life of being one of God's people. Um, and there are books next door. Why don't we show our appreciation to Ian for giving us some time? Uh, before you go, let, let me pray. Let me pray. Uh, Father, thanks for Ian. Uh, thanks for Pam and thanks for their kids. Uh, thanks for quartermasters who enable the front line. Uh, Father, uh, thank you uh, that we've learnt stuff tonight uh, to equip us for being your people tomorrow. Uh, Father, thank you uh, for the role of history, uh, for the role of your word, uh, for the way in which you are the God of history, in history, around history, who will end history. And thank you that this is all done through your son. Uh, Father, thank you uh, for George and Selina. I thank you that we'll meet them in heaven. I uh, thank you uh, that they knew and loved Jesus and that Jesus knew and loved them. Uh, Father, give us good rest tonight. Help us to wake tomorrow thinking on you, uh, on your design, on giving ourselves wholeheartedly uh, to the sake and the walk uh, of the kingdom of God through your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, no need to you don't want to, uh, but there's Tucker next door and then, um, yeah, have a good one and we'll see you Sunday.